Hi, everyone. If you're just joining us, uh, we'll get started in about a minute or two. So welcome. Okay, we're at the top of the hour, so I'll go ahead and get started here. I'm Matt Wagner. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Main Street America, and so happy to welcome you to our webinar today, which is entitled The Top 10 Google Tools to Grow Your Business. We're so glad to have you here today joining us, um, whether you're joining us live or viewing this on the demand uh, recording. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with Main Street America, we lead a national network of grassroots organizations committed to strengthening their main streets through community economic development and preservation. While many of our resources tend to support community leaders and business serving organizations, we also provide tools and educations, uh, education for small business owners within their commercial corridors, leading to projects like our Grow with Google Digital Coaches Partnership, which is what brings us here uh, today. So let me just share a few words of background here before we actually dive into the program. Um, this was launched in 2017. Uh, so Grow with Google helps people across the United States grow their skills, careers, and businesses by offering free tools, training, and events. So far, They've provided free digital skill training to 8 million Americans and counting through a network of 8,500 partners. Through Main Street America's partnership with Grow With Google, we've built this incredible team, um, and you're gonna meet two of them tonight, um, of 10 digital coaches to lead free trainings and empower small businesses with skills to grow. This partnership grew out of a need for increased tailored support for small business owners coming really out of the, the pandemic. Y'all know more than anyone, most businesses had to pivot during the, uh, during the COVID. Um, whether it was shifting, pivoting, whatever word you wanna use, there was a lot of transition uh, and challenges during the pandemic and post pandemic. And at Main Street America, we con uh, conducted a survey to see how we could help and find that among the most pressing needs, Businesses were really looking for more digital tools to survive and thrive. Coaches also provide in-person training to small business owners in rural communities across the country. These virtual or in-person trainings come in the form of group classroom settings and one-on-one -on -one consultations. So if you wanna learn more about this program, and to watch any of the on-demand trainings, we encourage you to visit the website, which you see uh, here, which is mainstreet.org backslash how we can help backslash grow with Google. So today, the team of coaches is going to walk you through a number of tools and resources that will help you take your business to the next level, no matter, frankly, what stage of growth you're in. Okay, so for beginning, to mature, growth and scaling, um, to maybe if you're uh, sort of looking at transitioning. You're here from two of our growth Google to, to, uh, digital coaches. So I'm going to just introduce them. First, there's Joshua Miller, who's our Pennsylvania coach. Joshua is a freelance communication specialist that works closely with individuals and small businesses to promote growth in business branding. And then you're also going to hear from Jared Foster, our Oklahoma coach. And Jared's the co-founder and chief operations officer at Elephant Rock Garden Supply, LLC. He's also served as a telecommunications specialist in the U.S. Army. So before we dive in, 
I want to point to you uh, towards a few other free resources that are available and you might be interested in as small business owners, entrepreneurs, um, and those from business supporting organizations. First, you can reach out directly to any of our Grow With Google coaches. So today's coaches, um, their contact information is listed here, or you can visit the Grow With Google coaches webpage as well. You'll also be receiving a follow-up email after this session with more options for connecting with our coaches. Secondly, we invite you to check out our recently launched Main Street Business Inside podcast. So it's available wherever you get your podcast. So please join um, us weekly to hear the powerful stories and gain insights from America's small business owners and entrepreneurs. We just finished up our first uh, series of 10 uh, interviews within the podcast. So tell your colleagues, friends, neighbors, what have you, shameless plug on our part. And lastly, if you're a small business owner, we invite you to take our small business survey, which will help Main Street America shape our programming and communications to better support you and your business. And I'll just pause a moment so you can scan the QR codes to access these resources. Okay, so finally, we have just a couple of housekeeping notes to run through before I turn it over to Joshua and Jared. First, this webinar is being recorded to view later. We will add the recording to our website and YouTube channel, and we'll email it out to all registrants and attendees. Secondly, if you're watching this webinar with a group, whether live or via the recording, please use the QR code to the right to list all the viewers to help us to track attendance. That would be super helpful to us and we're greatly appreciative. I'll pause again for those who would want to scan here. And then finally, please note that closed caption is available and you can click enable or disable based on your preferences. So that's it. Let's dive into the presentation. You're gonna love it. And I'll pass it over to Joshua to kick things off. I got to unmute myself first. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. Um, before we jump into things, I'm going to let you know that I am going to turn my camera off once we start the presentation, and then I'll come back on, but that allows you to kind of focus what we are uh, looking at on the screen. Um, before we jump into it, I wanted to let you know, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, the other coaches and I will do our best here to answer those if time allows at the end of the uh, this evening's presentation. And if we're unable to get to all of your questions, you can uh, feel free to join us during one of our scheduled office hours um, later on in November and then even early December, and we can dis discuss those questions further. So if you look at the screen there, we have three different dates. Uh, myself and Jared will be available for two of them. And then in early December, our other coach who was able to be here this evening, Tierra, will be there to assist you with any questions that you have. All right. <clears throat> Welcome to our webinar, Unleashing the Power of Google, the top 10 tool, the top 10 tools for small business success. Like I said, my name is Joshua Miller, and I'm excited to be here with you tonight. Whether you're a small business owner, entrepreneur, or marketer, you know that Google is one of the most powerful tools that you have at your disposal. But with so many different tools and features available, it can be hard to know where to start. That's why we are here today. In this webinar, we will be sharing the top 10 Google tools that you can use to organize and grow your business. By the end of this webinar, you'll have a clear understanding of how to use Google's tools to stay organized, collaborate with others, attract more customers, increase sales, and grow your business. Let's take a look at the first five tools that we're going to discuss here this evening that, we can, uh, that can help you stay organized and collaborate with others. First, we have Google Drive, which is a cloud-based storage service that allows you to store files online and access them from anywhere. Next, we have Google Docs and Sheets, which are free tools that allow you to create, edit, and share documents and spreadsheets online. We then have Google Slides, which is a free presentation tool that allows you to create and share presentations online and off. Last, we have Google Meet, which is a free high-quality video conferencing app that um, is designed to keep you connected with your friends, families, and colleagues. 
So let's jump into things here and start off with Google Drive. Google Drive is an online location where you can safely store your digital files that you create, share, use, and download. This service is included free with your Google account. Google Drive is a great place that you can store the important documents such as contracts, invoices, and marketing materials. This will help you keep your documents organized and secure for personal and business. Using Drive makes it easier to share your files with clients and partners. This can be helpful when collaborating on projects, providing quotes, and sending proposals. This will also help you protect your data in case of a hard drive failure or other disaster. One tip for collaborating with a team, you can create a team drive. And the team drive can be a shared folder that can be used by everyone in the group um, of people. That, and this is a great way for small businesses to collaborate on projects and share those files. When you store files in Google Drive, you can access them from anywhere, anytime that you are connected to the internet. You can also access Google Drive as well as the other individual apps from your mobile device. So the screen uh, shot here or sh is showing uh, Google Drive the icon on an iPhone. And if you know that there's going to be a chance you're going to be without internet access, you can turn the available offline setting for the files that you think you might need while offline. So first you need to be signed into your Google account. If you don't have a Google account, you can set one up for free. And if you are a business or employer uses Google Workspace, you may have an email address that doesn't look like a Gmail address, but it still is a Google account. If you are not sure, you can check with your work um, to see if you guys are currently using Workspace or not. Once you're signed in, you're going to click on the Google Apps icon. Here you'll see all the Google applications that come with your account. Now let's select the Google Drive and take a look at a few of its features. First, let's take a look at some of the main features of your drive. We have file storage, which is the area where your files and folders will be stored. You can click on any of these folders or files to open them up at any time. Next, we have the new button, which is what you'll click to create any new file or folder. We have the menu on the left side that gives you quick options for sorting through your files. And we have the search bar at the top that allows you to search for a file or folder by typing in words from its title or from the file itself. To access your Google tools, you're going to select new and choose the application you're uh, wanting to create. For this example, we will select a blank Google document. You would also have the option to create a new, uh, a new doc or sheets from a template as well. Remember, as soon as you open this document, it will save automatically to your drive, so there's no need to remember to save your work. Now let's look at creating a folder. Uh, let you create, cl sorry, click new and to select a folder to create a new folder and you'll be prompted to then enter the title of that folder. Staying organized. Uh, one way to stay organized is to use your start items uh, to allow for quick access to files and folders that you are regularly working on at that time. To add a star to a file that's already, to a file that's already open, just click the star icon next to the file's title. Now let's talk about how you can start a file or folder from your drive. First, right click on the folder and select add to star. Once you've done that, you'll be able to select start from the menu on the left side to see all your start files and folders. There will be times that you no longer are looking for a file or you, you no longer need a file or folder and you wanna save space within your drive. So you can delete these items. To delete, you can simply click on one of your folders uh, or files and drag it into the trash on the left-hand side of your screen. And another way to do is you can click, you can, um, another way to move your file or folders into the trash is by right-clicking on them and selecting delete. Once you move a file or folder into the trash, it will remain there for 30 days, at which point it will then be permanently deleted. You can also empty your trash to uh, at any time to permanently delete uh, all of its contents. Remember, if you delete a folder, you delete all the files inside that folder. So you decide, if you decide to delete a folder, be sure to move any files that you may want to keep out of that folder before deleting it. If you decide that you don't want the folder to be deleted, click on the trash to open it. You'll see the discarded files or folder in there. Right click on which one you wanna select and it will open a menu that gives you the option to restore or delete that item uh, permanently. We want to select restore to be able to pull that back into your Google Drive. Are you looking for something in your Google Drive? Simply type in one or more words from your file into the search bar at the top of your drive and any files or folders that include those words will start to appear.
Let's talk about sharing folders and files. When you store files in your drive, you can, you can give different people access to different files. For example, you created a draft agenda for a big event and you want everyone on your event planning committee to have access to this agenda. That's the path I'm showing you here on the left side of the screen. But you also have a budget file and you only want to share with one other person um, access to this file. That is the path that we're looking at on the right side of the screen. Even better, you can give different people levels of access to the files. People can either have access to edit a file, comment on without editing, or just to view it without the ability to comment or make any changes. You can also give people access to a complete folder and store a group of files in that folder. In this situation, everyone who has access to that folder will also have access to the files within the folder. And yes, you can give, you can give access to people outside of your organization. That's what makes this perfect for sharing information with clients and members. To share a file or folder, you will want to right click, select share, and now type in the email address of the person you want to share the folder with and click done. Then you get to choose the level of um, edit access that you're going to give that person. So you have editor, commenter, or viewer. And then when you are, you're completed there, you can add a note and then you can click send. To access files and or folders that, um, that others have shared with you, you'll want to click the shared with me from the menu on the left. You'll see, um, you'll see everything that has been shared with you. You'll see who has shared it with you and the date it was shared. If at any time you need to switch back to the view, the, uh, to, to, view, to view the files that you have created, just click my drive. All right, Google Docs is a web-based, um, free web-based program for creating and editing documents. You can use Google Docs to write almost any text-based document, such as a letter, resume, a work proposal, or meeting, uh, a meeting agenda or notes. What's great about these tools in Google is uh, lets you start with a blank file, or you can start off with one of the templates each tool provides. You can even create a default tem template to match your organi organization uh, style. Once you create a new blank document or template, you'll want it, uh, to title it. This will help you find it when you want to open it up later in your Google Drive. To title your document, just click on the words untitled document in the upper, upper left-hand corner and then type in the new title. This is the Google uh, Docs toolbar. This toolbar, which we'll find um, at the top of every Google Doc, contains buttons and the shortcuts for some of the most commonly performed actions. We'll use this toolbar to perform uh, formatting for the next several minutes, but it's also got a lot of features that we won't have time to cover here. Um, to read about what each button does, just hover the cursor over um, that icon. I want to show you a feature that makes it uh, that makes collaboration much easier. Once you create a file, you might want feedback from other people. I already mentioned that you can share files with other people. Here's how you can add comments to your files and ask others to contribute to them. First, click on um, or highlight the word or phrase you want to comment on. In this example, where we've used, have you started looking for replacement? There are a couple different ways then we can add a comment. I recommend you go to the top of the screen and find the plus icon. At the top of the example here, we added a, a call out that says add comment. That was where the plus icon is. Click that plus icon and you'll go, um, you'll get a little pop up where you can type in your comment. When you do that, everyone who has access to this file will see that comment. But you can also alert or assign someone to that comment. On the right side of the screen, I'm showing, uh, showing you Randy alerted and assigned a comment to Pamela. You can tag someone in the comment by typing a plus or the at symbol and then their email address, the, the person that you want alerted. You can see the example of Randy type at Pamela at example.com and typed in her comment. Once you do that, you're given the option to assign the comment to the person as well. This comment is assigned to Pamela. So now that she knows she's responsible for answering and resolving the comment. When you alert, um, when you alert or assign someone a, a comment to someone, they will get an email notification. They can go into the document, read the comment, reply back, make changes, and resolve it if they wish. Any resolved comments will disappear from the sidebar of the actual file, but all the communication is stored in the comment area, which can be accessed through the small gray uh, callout box next to it. When you're finished with your file, you may want it, um, to save it to another format, such as like a PDF. If you're in Google Sheets or Slides, you will also be able to download those files into other similar spreadsheet and presentation types. And in case you were wondering, you can also open up files that are built in other tools like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint in Google Drive. You do this by going to File, then Open. As I mentioned earlier, you may want to access some files offline. 
The make available offline feature will allow you to access, edit, and save work and files that you indicate when you don't have internet connection. But you do need to set this up while you have internet connection. In the screenshot here, I'm showing you how to go to the file menu, scroll down to make available offline and click enable. Be sure that you enable this feature for any files you think you'll need offline before you get stuck without the internet connection. Also, you must do this for any device that you'll want to access these files offline on. For example, if you wanna use your phone to access these files while offline, you'll need to go to the file when you're online from that, from that device and adjust the setting there. All right, let's look at Google Sheets here. Do you track inventory, create budgets, manage projects, or analyze data within your business? Google Sheets is a powerful tool that can be used by small businesses to save money, collaborate, and more, effect and, and more effectively um, tackle, or, uh, tackle these tasks. Google Sheets is easy to use, even for people who are not familiar with spreadsheets, and it is constantly being updated with new features and functionality. So let's take a look how, at one example how you can use Google Sheets for your business with creating a project tracker. The image on the right here shows a computer screen containing the basic project tracker containing categories for task, status, start and due dates, notes, and completion. This spreadsheet includes some of the basic categories such as the tasks, the status or the progress of that task, the date that that task was started, the task due date, the owner of the individual task, a column for notes to record additional information, and a column that shows when that task has been completed. As you move forward with your project, fill in your spreadsheet with the information you need to manage it. The image shows the project tracker with some of the information typed in. Make your tracker more specific. Enter the name of the task owner, the person responsible for the task in, in each appropriate column. You can then use this column to keep track of the task you assign and easily gauge how much work each team member has left to do. Finally, list out at least the due, or a few of the due dates, and then you can record the date when you start and when you start a task and when you plan to finish it. In this sample tracker, we'll create a drop-down menu that allows you to easily select um, the progress of each task. The image on the slide here shows a spreadsheet tracker that's in status column, and a user has added a drop-down menu showing different options to mark, uh, uh, mark the task status. Adding this drop-down menu will allow you to save time in the long run and keep your file organized with consistent responses. You can create one of these yourself by using the data validation. Another way you might wanna collaborate with your team is to add a comment to include someone in a conversation. For example, should you, um, you should ask a team member how long they think the task will take to complete and if they have encountered any problems. This slide shows a user adding a comment to one cell in the spreadsheet. Let's say one of the tasks is close to its due date. Imagine, imagine if you wanna check in with them and ask the task owner to see whether it's on track or not. Select that, show, the, sorry, select that cell that contains the due date right click and select comment, and then write a short reminder or question about that task and choose comment. When you add a comment, you can also designate someone on your team as a specific owner of this issue. To do so, again, we're gonna type that plus or the at symbol followed by their email address. You can ask for an update. You can have a specific task that you or your team member needs to do. You can mark comments as, um, as action items. This person will receive that email with your comment and they'll be responsible for completing that task and then marking it complete once done. All right, now imagine that you've planned your virtual event, you're using a to-do list, you've collaborated with your team on making that agenda for the event. Next, you might need to find a way to communicate effectively with a large group of people. You might want a way to plan out how you're going to, or what you're going to say during that presentation. For these situations and for plenty of others in the workplace, building a presentation in Google Slides is your best solution. Even if it is an event just in a small, with a small team meeting, using a slide deck can keep everyone on track, pace, and engaged. Now let's take a look at how to use a presentation to share your progress or ideas at work. You can start from a blank slide deck, or as you guessed it, we're gonna start uh, Google Slides by choosing one of the several templates that is um, offered. As with our other projects, we're going to get started here. So again, we're gonna click with the uh, click new and click Google Slides, and we're gonna select and open from template. That... Then we're gonna choose one that best fits the project that we're going to work on. Once again, your template opens up in a new tab and automatically saves to your Google Drive. As you can see, every template is going to come uh, include pre-designed layouts. Layouts include pre-arranged text boxes, formatting, and slides will make suggestions on how to use each layout. You can select a different layout to present different information like a main point, important data, or a caption. To do this, click Add, 
um, click add within plus sign and then select a new layout that helps you present the information that you need to share in your uh, with your team and business partners. As you build out your presentation, you may want to include some non-photo visual images. Adding illustrations and videos keeps the presentation interesting, helps you grab your audience attention. You might use photos to introduce your team to the audience, or you can link a chart or graph from Google Sheets to show progress or explain a budget. To add these elements, you're gonna access the insert menu, and then you can choose the kind of visual element you want to include. Um, you can add a visual element like a photo or video directly from your Google Drive, or you can search the web to find an image that suits your presentation. Make sure whatever image you use that you do have the rights. When you search the web for an image directly from the slides application, the images returned in your search um, will automatically be free to use. At this point, you've built a slide deck to support your presentation. You've selected the layouts, you've customized the text and other visuals to enhance it. Now you might wanna share the slide deck with your team to get their input, or maybe you wanna make it available to everyone who is in the audience. You can even embed the presentation on a web page. To access these settings, use the share icon, just like you did from Google Docs or Sheets. Um, you type the colleague's email address and decide what kind of access you wanna give them. And then, or you can get the sharing link and add that um, other files or documents. All right, let's take a look at Google Meet, which is a video conferencing program that comes with every Google account. Video conference allows you to have meetings with people using your computer or your mobile device. You can use Google Meet for work, family, uh, social gatherings. You can have one-on-one -on -one meetings, meet with the group. You can give presentations um, and many other features within, within your organization. If you have a Gmail account, then you have access to the free version of Google Meet at no cost. You do not need a Google account to participate in a Google Meet. However, if you don't have a Google account, the meeting organizer or someone from the organization must grant you access to that meeting. If you're part of the organization that has a business uh, version of Google Meet, which is included in the Google Workspace account, your interface might look a little different than what we are going to look at here in the next couple slides. To start or schedule a Google Meet, we're going to select the Meet icon, which looks like a little video camera from the Google uh, Apps menu. And then you're gonna select a uh, new meeting and you have three options to choose from. You can create a new meeting for later. You can start an instant meeting or you can schedule it in Google Calendar. So let's take a look how to schedule one in Google Calendar. First, you're gonna give your meeting a title. You're gonna click on the date and choose the date and your time that your meeting will take place as well as an ending time. Now you're gonna click on the description and type in a short description if it, if it is needed for your meeting. Finally, you'll go to and invite guests uh, for your meeting by clicking the words add guest and type in all the email addresses of the people you wish to invite. You will see the invitees appear under the guest. And when you're done, you'll click save. The people that you will invite will receive an email invitation letting them know about the event, including a link to join the meeting. When you save the meeting on your calendar, everyone that you invited um, to the meeting will get an email invitation that looks like what the image you see on the screen here. Um, and the meeting link will be highlighted they'll have the option to accept or decline this invitation. If you, go, if you go back into the meeting on your own calendar, you'll see who has replied yes, who has responded no, and who has not yet replied at all. Um, let's take a look at a few features that once we have a meeting in progress. To start a chat feature, which is a great way to share links, um, simply click on the chat button as you see on the screen. And once the chat feature opens up, you can start uh, typing your message. And when you're ready to share that, you can simply click enter or the send icon. To share your screen, click the present now button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. A menu will pop up showing options for sharing your screen. You have the opportunity to choose present your entire screen, a window or a tab. If you choose to share your entire screen, anything you do on your computer screen will be visible to the people in that call. So it's important to know in case you have anything personal open at that time. If you choose to share a window or a tab, they will only see the browser window or tab that you have selected. If you're presenting to show animations or audio, it is best to present with sharing with, uh, with one tab. Last, I wanna show you where to go to make some additional um, uh, settings changes within Google Meet. From the more options menu, just simply click the selecting buttons. Now I'd like to hand things off to Jared here to discuss the next five tools. Awesome, thanks Josh. Hey everybody, I'm Jared Foster. I'm the Growth Google Coach for the state of Oklahoma. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna 
take my camera off here and we're going to dive into five more tools that you can use to grow your business. So these five tools that we're going to talk about are going to be more geared towards building your online presence, uh, where those five we talked about before were for uh, making sure you were optimizing productivity. These are going to be more for your online stuff. So we're going to go over Google Business Profiles. We'll talk a little bit about Google Bard. We'll jump in and talk a little bit about Google Analytics. We'll look at the Google Search Console, and then we'll show you how to set up a smart campaign using Google Ads. All right. So Google Business Profiles are one of the strongest tools that exist from Google to help small business owners out. Um, they help you show up in more than one way. So you can populate these on Google searches, just your regular, you know, go Google it. But you can also pop up on maps when people are looking for businesses that are like yours. It allows you to meet your potential customers in the moment that they start looking for a solution to their problems. Maybe you're looking for a fancy restaurant or need a plumber. You probably Googled it or you looked for the closest one on maps. So let's break down what these Google business profiles look like to a searcher. You'll see when they populate the name of the business, some photos and videos that can be used to attract attention to that business profile. You'll see some quick links, things like a link to the website or a way to share that business. Um, for businesses that have a phone number associated with them, you'll be able to call directly if they're using, if the searcher is using a mobile device or an option to get directions to that business. Um, your final business profile might look a little bit different depending on the type of business that you're running, but this is generally how the layout looks. Next slide, please. Um, you can actually go and learn more about Google business profiles by visiting google.com forward slash business. And this is where we'll go to set up our Google business profiles if you don't already have one. You'll go to that web page and click the Manage Now button. So the process to get verified uh, does take a little bit of time. It's pretty intuitive. It asks basic general information about your business, things like the name, the phone number associated, maybe where you're located, those kind of things. And then you'll get an option to choose that, choose your verification method. It's normally a postcard or some form of, of call. Um, but once you're verified, you'll be able to access your business profile simply by searching your business name on Google or by accessing it through the google.com forward slash business page that we talked about before. But you'll be brought to a screen that looks like what you see on your slide right now. It gives you a lot of different options for you to edit different information about your business and access some more of the features that Google Business Profiles offer. I would like to note that you, you do need to be signed into the business profile or the Google account that you created this business profile with uh, to manage it. One of the first things we can do there is click on the edit profile button. And we're gonna talk about this specific one first, but when you click on all the different things that you can do with the business profile, they function generally the same. So you'll click on the first, first one called edit profile. And in this section, we'll be able to make all kinds of different changes to things about our business that our customers see. So if we need to change the name of our business or maybe change the category of business that we do, or certainly if we need to edit the description of our, our business, this is where we'll go to do that. You can add things like your phone number or maybe change your opening hours. All that information that's really relevant and the first things that customers are going to be looking for on your business page will be found here. I do wanna note with the descriptions, you do have a limit of 750 characters and you should really try and focus on the things that your business does not necessarily what promotions and sales you have going on. There's actually another piece of business profiles that will allow you to highlight those. So when you when you write your description, try and make sure that you're doing you're putting words in there that help you define yourself and associate with the the kind of audience that will be looking for your products. At the bottom of the edit profile section, there's actually one more thing that I'd really really like to talk about, and that is a place where you can add some attributes to your business. Um, these attributes are super awesome for signaling pride in your identity, and they also can help, pe help people and potential shoppers um, who make an effort to support those different communities. 
You can also add a lot of different things other than just these ones here. They're always adding more. Um, so if you don't see one that is particularly aligned with what your identity is, they are always adding more. So just keep checking back. But you can also add other services you offer, things like wheelchair accessibility or free Wi-Fi, or maybe even you can talk about what payment types that you accept. Just a great place to make sure you're giving that extra information that somebody might be looking for in their consideration phase. You can also create updates to make sure you're staying in contact with your customer base through your, your Google business profile. Not all of your customers are on social media, which makes this Google business profile a strong point to be able to connect with those who aren't using social media to get that information. You'll have a few different options um, when you click on the add updates section, right? So you can do updates that are specifically a new product, something's going on, you wanna share that with your, with your customer base. You can also add offers, which allow you to drop a link that takes them to maybe a, a coupon code or a directly to a shopping cart, which allows them to take advantage of any of your sales you've got going on. And then you can also promote events. These are things, you know, maybe a customer appreciation event, something like that that you'd be able to post and make sure you're connecting with your customers and letting them know what's going on with your business. There's a couple other ways that you can use Google business profiles to connect with your customer base as well. And the number, the number one is reading, reading those reviews and commenting and replying to them. And we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Um, there's also a messaging feature which allows you to message your customers in real time. So if they have a question and they wanna to talk to someone from the business, they can use this feature if you have it enabled. You'll get an email notification that shows that somebody has messaged your Google business profile and you'll be able to give them information in real time. I've used this personally in my small business a lot uh, when people are asking if we have a certain product in stock. Uh, there's there's options on here that show that information, but it's really nice to be able to directly connect with those co customers in the moment and say, yeah, I have that in or it's coming in on a truck next week. It's just a really good way to stay in contact with your customer base. And then the third one is the Q&A forms. So it's important to note with these that people can ask, anybody can ask these, these questions on your business profile and anyone can answer them. Um, so keep up with those if you plan to use that feature make sure that you are answering them accurately. And so I said a minute ago that reviews were one of the really, really important ways that people um, can connect with your business. So a lot of the times folks will make decisions based on, on the reviews of a business that they see on a business profile or any other reviewing site. They'll make a lot of their decisions based on the quality of those reviews. So one of the things we definitely wanna be doing is asking for as many of them as we can. The higher those review ratings are and the more we have, the better our business profile is going to perform. One of the options we'll get is to ask for reviews is one of those buttons up there. And you can send them either via email, you can post them on your social media, or you can push them anywhere that you might be able to use a link. This is just a great way to you know, for example, add it to the bottom of your email signature. So that way you're always asking for those reviews and it can generate you some good content, user generated content on your Google business profile. All right, on to the next tool. We're gonna to talk a little bit about Google Bard. So Google Bard is an experimental AI service that's designed to provide users with accurate and timely information through thoughtful responses and conversational interaction. That's a fancy way of saying you can ask questions to Google Bard and it will give you answers back. Um, it's similar to those, for those of you who are familiar, it's similar to ChatGPT. Uh, this is for the usability is really the, the reason that it's structured that way. And you can use ChatGPT, or <laughs> you can use Google Bard um, to develop different kinds of content and SEO friendly descriptions for your product and services. So think for example, uh, when, you have, when you've had writer's block in the past, I get this a lot with product descriptions specifically. And so I've used Google Bard to write all kinds of product descriptions for the different products I offer. It helps me save a ton of time as a business owner so that I can get back to doing what I do best instead of trying to be a writer when that is definitely not my background. You can use it to answer customers' questions 
creating social media content. I've used it to do this a lot too. You can actually use Google Bard by prompting it. That's the prompt is the, uh, the question you ask it. If you ask Google Bard to say, hey, I need a 30 day calendar of content that I can post about my business that sells flooring, then it'll help you define what that con content needs to look like and give you some ideas. You can access Google Bard by searching for Google Bard just on a Google search or by typing in g.co forward slash Bard in your URL bar. The next tool we'll talk about is Google Analytics. Google Analytics can be used to track website traffic. It can be used to track conversions or the desirable actions that people take on your website. It can be used to track marketing campaigns and find out how people found your website and which channels are performing well for you, such as social media or email marketing. And it can even help you improve your website design by finding out what pages and places on your website that they navigate away from or spend a whole lot of time on. So Google Analytics is a free of charge online tool. It's one of the most prevalent um, and popular analytics options available. It integrates with almost every website, um, whether you're, you created it yourself or you're using a website builder. Most of those have a integration for Google Analytics. I know a lot of the popular ones like GoDaddy, Wix, those kind of products, they do offer integrations with Google Analytics. Um, and the primary focus of Google Analytics is to help you understand the visitor behavior on your website and the actions that they take. It helps you find how they, it helps you find out how they found your site and helps you track and record those conversions we talked about just a second. Once you begin to use Google Analytics, you can start to get a clear picture of who is visiting your website and which groups of visitors are the most likely to help you achieve your goals. So for example, you may have discovered that social networks bring a lot of people to your website, but these visitors don't end up buying many products. However, you've also found that email marketing campaigns bring only a few visitors, but they almost always purchase something before navigating away. Google Analytics doesn't give you information about individual people, but it does help you to find how different groups of people interact with your website and what characteristics and similarities they have. So like we said before, you can use Google Analytics to understand what content your audience is interested in. So the things that they spend more time looking at or breezing over so that you can make informed decisions about what to do with your website and what kind of things they like seeing. And you can also use it to make sure you're focusing on the right campaigns and the right marketing channels that are developing the end state that you wanna have accomplished by your website. If that's make more sales, maybe one, Maybe email marketing is performing better. Analytics helps you find that out. If you're setting up Google Analytics for the first time, you'll go to g.co forward slash analytics and click on get started today. You'll create a property. And when you sign into analytics, you'll be creating your account and then associating the website or the domain that you're going to use analytics on. That's where you're, what, creating a property is. We'll go ahead and move on to the Google Search Console. So the Google Search Console is a no-cost tool that's designed to help you improve your site's performance. If Google Analytics is all about the people coming to your website so you can find out how they got there and what they're doing, then Google uh, Search Console is the answer to how your website actually performs. Think of this as the nuts and bolts of, or a way to measure the nuts and bolts of what's going on behind the scenes. It helps you define things like slow load times, what pages have been indexed, what pages haven't been indexed, and how to make sure that your website is performing optimally. I know that's super technical and it can get, it can get in the weeds with it. Um, if you do have somebody who is managing your website for you, it would be a good thing to ask them about Google Search Console. If you don't and you manage it yourself, this is just a great tool to make sure that it's functioning the way you want it to. It also includes a tool that's called Mobile Friendly Test as part of Google Search Console. And what that does is allow you to make sure that your website can be viewed from a mobile phone just as simply as it can be viewed from a desktop or a laptop.
Search Console is really important for the concept of search engine, engine optimization because it helps you measure your search or your site's search traffic and performance. And it really helps you dial in and fix all the issues that could be happening or lets you know that you're doing a great job and there's none. It's typically used by SEO specialists and marketers to monitor website traffic or optimize your rank in Google search results by fixing those issues. But it's a good thing to know that it exists and it's a good thing to know how to find it. And to access it, you can either do a Google search for Google Search Console or just type in g.co forward slash search console in your URL bar. When you do set up your search console for the first time, you'll have an option of either selecting or of either entering your full domain or a specific URL prefix, which is just a one, one page of your website. If you enter the domain, Search Console will analyze and try and figure out all of the things going on with your entire website. Whereas if you choose to use the URL prefix, it will be only that web page that you put on or in that link. All right, on to the next tool, Google Ads. So what we're going to do with Google Ads today is we're going to talk a little bit about it, and then we're going to show you how to set up a smart campaign. That way you can get started after leaving here today. So Google Ads is a pay-per-click model of advertising, which means that advertisers only pay when a user clicks on their ads. It allows for targeted advertising, which is precise targeting based on users' search queries, their demographics, and their online behavior. And it offers performance measurements, which provide detailed analytics to track and ad performance and return on investment. So Google Ads, Google Ads work by starting with a Google search. The searcher types in a word or a phrase into Google, and that's what we call a search query. And then Google's algorithm creates a search results page that lists websites and other resources to help the searcher find answers. Clicks on these organic website links are free. And sites can't pay for Google to be listed higher or in better positions than organic search results. It's all determined by that regular al algorithm. So helping sites appear in the search results is a tactic called search engine optimization or SEO. And we're not really gonna focus on that today. We're gonna focus on advertising. And so every time someone searches on Google, there's also a Google ads algorithm that runs simultaneously and auctions off that position to advertisers. Um, in a matter of milliseconds, Google ads determines the winning ads and displays them on the search results page next to all those organic results. Advertisers bid for those opportunities to show up, and then whoever wins that bid is the one that uh, is applied to that position. So to set up your Google Ads account for the first time, you're gonna go to google.com forward slash ads and click on start now. You'll sign in to your Google account, and it'll take you into a default smart mode, which is made to quickly set up your first advertising campaigns and gives you some automated ad management that makes it a little bit easier for those that aren't really uh, steeped in the pay-per-click um, ads side. So at this point, you're going to really be doing two things if this is your first time creating a Google ad. You'll be creating your account and your first smart campaign. So you'll start that process by entering the name of your business. This would be the name that you want people to see displayed. Then you'll enter your website. Now it's important to note that when you enter this website, it doesn't have to be your homepage. It could be the shopping cart that you want people to land in when they click on your product ad. Or it could be a lead form that you want them to land on a, or a, a web page that contains a lead form so that you can get their contact info. It doesn't always have to be that homepage. But whichever one you put, that next step, it'll show you a preview of where those, where those people that click on your ad, where they're going to land and what they'll see after you're clicking on it. And the next thing you'll be able to do is select your advertising goal. Now there's lots of different goals that you can choose from when you're advertising. Some of those are getting more calls or making more, more sales on your website. Um, I would always like to point out that it's a good idea to create more than one ad campaign if you have different goals. Don't try to make one ad do all of the different things. Make specific ads with specific goals. That way you can measure the effectiveness of each one instead of trying to go broad with it. 
The next thing you'll do is write your text ad. So these text ads always have three headlines and two description lines. And this is a great place for you to go back and use Google Bard if you were maybe needing some help coming up with ideas. This is a great place to use that. In step seven, you'll be able to choose different keyword themes to match your searches. These are more relevant to the ad you're creating right then than they are to your overall business. So if the ad you're creating is maybe for a specific product, you can add keyword themes that are relevant to that product. Just always a good idea to make sure that they're focused on the theme of the, of the ad you're creating and not super broad. The next step will be to select the geographic location of where your ad's going to be displayed. So you can set this for either specific zip codes, cities, and regions, or you can create a radius around a specific area that can be kind of like a net of where your ad will be displayed. And then the last step, you'll set a budget. It's important to note with these budgets that you are chart, you are you have a daily max and a monthly max. You may go over that daily max, but you'll never exceed the monthly max. Um, that's, I know that's a question that's asked all of the time. Really the, the backstop is whatever you set that monthly max at, you will never exceed that number in a month. Um, just something to note. And after that, after you've set that budget and defined what you want that to be, you'll be able to send your campaign and make it live. This is the, the piece where you'll be able to review everything. You'll be able to go back through and make sure all of your text ads are good, all of the media you've added is what you want it to look like, and all of it is looking clean and ready to go, and then you can launch your first ad. And that is a smart campaign in Google Ads. Okay, so we've covered 10 Google tools that you can use to grow your small business, and I know that it's been a lot. We are going to have um, an opportunity to answer a few questions here at the end, and I'm gonna share with you a few of the resources that we can provide to help you keep learning after today or this evening. So one of the ones that we offer is our YouTube channel. Um, it is Grow with Google, um, or youtube.com forward slash grow with Google. It's got all kinds of videos similar to the webinar that we're putting on today. It's got some other tips and tricks that you can use. Great place if you love watching videos to learn from. Another service we offer is our Google Career Certificates. You can, you can tune in with these and request them. Um, they can help you get different kind of training and skills in different careers. There's everything from IT support and project management to data analytics and digital marketing. So if you're interested in these, um, please reach out. You can go to grow.google grow forward slash certificates. Um, that's really where you can start to figure out where you can apply for these and all that. It's a great program. I hold one of these certificates. I can't brag on it enough. It is awesome. And then, Another resource we have is our google.com forward slash grow website. It's got lots of different resources for different, different groups, um, whether you're a teacher or student or you're a small business or you're looking to get one of the certificates. It is a, a great place for you to access all kinds of different resources through Grow with Google. And then we'll have our office hours um, for the coaches, for Joshua and I and then Tiara later in December. Uh, or early in December, I suppose. But you'll be able to scan any of those QR codes to get access to our office hours where you can ask any extra questions if we don't answer them all here today. And I just want to say, again, thank you, everybody, for attending today's workshop from Main Street America. We are super eager to learn about the businesses and entrepreneurs that are participating in our programs. And we'd really, really appreciate it um, if you would complete the questionnaire that's included in this QR code, it only takes a couple minutes and it helps us know what we're doing right and how we're, how we can help out. So once again, thank you so much for attending this workshop. And if you have any questions, Josh and I will do our best to answer what we can. Thanks, Jared. Uh, it does look like we have a couple of questions in the chat. 
Um, <clears throat> all right. So the first one is how often should you add updates to your Google business profile? Um, now, are you referring to just like broad updates and, and checking the status of your profile? Or are you actually referring to like the updates, which is then the offers, updates and events? See if we get her to follow up with updates like the post and the events. Okay. Jared, do you have anything you want to add on that as far as the, the frequency? Yeah. I, so I don't think there's a hard and fast rule to, to how often you should update, but I would say try to do, I would try to be weekly about it, you know, just try and keep that information flowing in front of people. It It's not, you don't have to post every single day. Um, but it is definitely valuable to keep posts up there because it's going to help you rank higher um, on those on those searches as well. So exactly, and I was going to say the same thing. I don't think you have to follow an exact time frame. Um, you know, one thing too is you can kind of think of what can you repurpose from your social media. So mm -hmm. you can't force events. I mean, you clearly if you have if you have frequent events, you know, you might have those more often than other businesses. But some businesses aren't going to have events going on very often, other than maybe like holidays or special times throughout the year or community events that they're doing something with. But usually between updates and offers and events, you can find a reason to, like you said, at least do something every week, every couple of weeks. The big thing is making it a habit and being consistent about it. You don't want to let that feature go unused for months at a time um, because it does factor into your the, the algorithms for your business profile. Hi, everybody. I am Liz. I am jumping in from behind the scenes to help out with the Q&A. Um, so real quick, before I go to the next question, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat, but if you want to um, talk, feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question from Samuel. He says, how can I join my local guide seven to my business profile as I have 1 million views? Uh, Samuel, what is the business? And you can type that in the chat or like you said, you can have your uh, unmuted. Your business is tourism. So you're set up as a local guide within within those the Google local guide parameters, but you also have a tourism business. Is it, am I understanding that correct? Okay, that's a tricky one. Um, because I believe that and Jared, can you confirm those are two separate uh aspects of Google. Th those are not connected. The business profile is specifically for that business profile. It is for a place where people can come and hire you or reach out for a particular service. But that that local guide status, that was an, a program that Google initiated um, some time back to, again, to get people excited and, and also participating in, in these business profiles, to want to leave reviews, to want to, um, you know, update pictures and make sure that information is properly displayed and, and accurate because a lot of business profiles go unmanaged. I see them every single day, uh, ones that have outdated addresses, phone numbers, they've been permanently closed and, and owners just didn't know that it was their responsibility to take that ownership and manage it. So we want these, these local tour guides to, um, to help keep those accountable um, and accurate. But as far as connecting it, they're they're really, I'm I'm not familiar of any way to pull those two together because again, I believe they're completely separate. Um, and like you know, your local guide status, um, as far as a seven and the million views, like that is not that is not necessarily the same thing as your business. Even though you are very fortunate, your business business is in tourism. There's still there's still two different um, matters. Would you add anything to that, Jared? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, I, I think you're 100% correct there um, as far as not being able to directly link it. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't maybe reach out to those followers in some shape or way and say, hey, look, I've got a Google business profile for my my, nor my new you know tourism Google business profile for my agency that I'm running that's here. And I would really appreciate it if, you know, you could give me a like or a follow or something, you know, whatever, whatever things that you can reach out for um, and kind of garner some some input from that 
audience yeah, you already yeah. have. That's a great suggestion. And I'm going to add a little bit to that too. Now thinking kind of like a way, how can you use some of you, those experiences to market your own business? So something you can think of is like, like Jared said, go back and find some of those people that you've, uh, you know, you've built a status with from the local guide aspect and ask for reviews, connect with them. Those, some of the pictures that you're leaving with other business profiles as you're traveling, attach them to your own business profile as far as like your experience and like what you're doing to better your tourism business through personal experience. And also, again, with the updates uh, feature, you know, as an update, when you're traveling, you could easily say, you know, we're out here in, you know, this location, here's a couple, add a couple of pictures and, and you know, you're gaining knowledge, you're learning, you're having, you're adding new packages to your tourism business. I mean, there's ways that you can pull that, that same content into your business profile, but as far as like merging two profiles, there are two profiles in two different areas of Google and there's just no way to link them. But I think that the material and the content you are, you're creating in one, you can also use to help promote it um, in your business piece. Awesome. Um, I know we're at time, but do you do you guys want to take another question or I can um, take another? I know there I know there's at least one more question. Yeah. Um, and the, yes, this is being recorded and you'll get a copy of the presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. um, where was that other question, Liz? Do yeah. you see it? Yes. So we have a question from Marianne. She says, How often should you add updates to your Google business profile? Oh no, I think we, we got that one. I think it was Carrie. I just see it now. Is Carrie there a time frame to allow an update post to end, for example, if an event is on 12 1 and you want it and you want that to also come off the info at 12 2? So with yeah. events, you actually, when you select that, when you go into that window for updates and you select offer update event, it's going to open up three different windows depending on which one you select. For events, there actually is a start date, start time, and an end date and an end time so that that information will get removed um, from that profile. I hope that helps, Carrie. Great. Looks like that is it for questions. And thanks, everybody. And again, if you have anything else, you know you have our email addresses as well as those office hours. Um, hop on. We'd love to chat more. Have a good night, everyone.